Hello, and welcome back to Lunch and Learn, the Leeds video podcast, where we take an in-depth look at the art scene here in Lincoln and the arts industry as a whole. Today, we are going inside the art of fashion and the world of reality TV as we sit down with House of DBF designer and influencer, Brittany Hampton. In the fall of 2014, Brittany starred in and won the E! Network reality TV show, House of DBF which led her to become the first global brand ambassador for the luxury lifestyle brand, Diane von Furstenberg. Since her stint with the brand, Brittany has been a correspondent and fashion expert with the E! Network, the Met Gala, and the 2016 red carpet at the Oscars. She'll be joining us on the pod live today to talk about her creative outlook on the fashion industry, her award-winning career as a stylist, and how her identity has shaped her into a leading voice and personality in the world of design. <clears throat> I'm Ryan Savage, an education and outreach specialist here at The Lead, and here with me to discuss is the Leeds Communications Manager, Lauren Durbin. Hi, Lauren. Welcome back to the pod. Hey, Ryan. I am so happy to be back with you this month. Yes, I'm so happy to have you back. And, you know, I've really been looking forward to this episode. One of the things that I set out to do when I started concepting for the podcast was really representing a diversity of art forms <clears throat> and exposing people, exposing our patrons to all the different kinds of the arts, both fine and performing. Um, mm -hmm. And fashion is definitely not the first thing that comes to someone's mind when, you know, someone says that they're an artist. But I really think that coming from the Performing Arts Center of like the lead, fashion really is right up our alley because so much of the presentation of fashion is performative, you know, with the New York Fashion Week, with the runway shows and the Met Gala, not only do models themselves, you know, embrace a performer's physicality, but they almost have to take on a character when they put on these extravagant costumes and pieces of clothing. Uh, I'm thinking Billy Porter making his entrance as the Egyptian sun god at the 2019 Met Gala, carried in by six shirtless men. And if that isn't theater, I don't know what is. Oh, absolutely. I mean, beyond the fact that obviously fashion is undoubtedly itself an important visual art form, runway shows and everything that goes along with that is absolutely theater. I mean, it's all the same elements coming together, right? Performers and yeah. lighting and costume design and sound design, all of that being used to set a mood and tell a very specific story as selected by designers and writers and artists. So there is a lot for a performing arts center that, that we have in common with that whole world of fashion design. Yeah. But before we get any further with this, I wanted to give our viewers a sneak peek into our live guest who we will have on with us in just a few moments, Brittany Hampton. Again, she is an acclaimed fashion designer and social media influencer and has worked and modeled for high-end brands like Diane von Furstenberg. Here's a short clip for everybody of Brittany telling us a little bit about her background and how she got her start in the fashion industry. <clears throat> I'm Brittany Hampton, and I'm a social media influencer with Next Models. Most of you guys probably know me from the House of DBF. I actually graduated FITM in fashion design, and from FITM, wanting to be a designer, one of the main things that I decided to do was to become a wardrobe stylist. So before the House of DBF, I was the in-house stylist at Nickelodeon for two years, and I dressed girls like Ariana Grande and Jeanette McCurdy and all the Nickelodeon stars that everyone knows and loves. Um, and from that opportunity, I got the opportunity to be on the House of DVF. I think that the show was a platform of women that want to be in the fashion industry because we got to learn how to, you know, design, be on the creative team, style, and not only that, but travel the world and represent a brand. This was balancing out two different jobs that you had to do. Like you had to be on a reality show and you had to work for a corporate company. So to put the face on of a reality TV person and to put the face on of an actual, like, like employee of a company was difficult. It's tough and sometimes we were put in positions which we are on a regular day basis where you know you might sit with your boss and be like god I don't like this girl but you have to learn how to work with people and you have to learn how to turn your on switch on and your off switch off and it was very tough for me especially social media wise I took a lot of impact on who I was because I'm African-American so a lot of people say well you're fake on TV and you're fake at work and it's like whoa no I'm who I am, but sometimes I could be a little bit more stern. I think that if I could 
would give any advice to a younger woman that may have a little bit of an attitude or may not like their employees or bosses and coworkers that they work with, um, I would just say take a second. Take a second to really think about what's more important in to you work, in terms of school, work, in terms of you know, school. You know, it's never okay to burn bridges. You always want to remember that that person that you're with you never know if that's gonna be your next boss five years from now. So don't ever burn bridges and just take a second, go in the closet, go yell at yourself and then come back to reality. <laughs>Uh, you know, I thought one of my favorite parts about that video is I think it's super interesting listening to Brittany talk about balancing out the two different jobs, but corporate fashion design and reality TV. And it's like, where does the actor line end and the real world start? Because you watch a lot of reality TV and it really feels <clears throat> like something authentic that you're watching and that you're really digging into someone's life and experiencing it with them. Um, but I just thought it was interesting how she made that, that clear distinction that, you know, that there is kind of a line and you are occasionally playing a role and how, and how those, how those two positions kind of interweave together. Sure. I think my favorite piece of advice she offered was about picking battles and not burning bridges, or at least being intentional about which bridges you are choosing to burn because they're not always <laughs> it and worth it. And I think that's excellent advice for anybody. But as far as her thoughts on reality TV, I mean, just like we've talked about runway shows being performance, obviously so is reality TV. When you think about how many dozens, sometimes hundreds of hours of video is shot to be cut down into half an hour or an hour, obviously yeah. there are choices being made about what story you want to tell when you're editing hundreds of hours into one hour. And so that's, that's very similar. And obviously there's a story being told. Um, but the best reality TV, in my opinion, is the reality TV that really opens up opportunities for people who are passionate about an industry or an art form that maybe they would not have gotten otherwise. It puts these new yeah. these new opportunities forward. And obviously, that was the case with House of DVF and our guest today. And uh, all of this leads us to introducing Brittany, right, Ryan? Yes, you know, uh, we're so excited to have Brittany join us live to talk about her creative outlook on the fashion industry, her award-winning career as a stylist, and how her identity has shaped her into a leading voice and personality in the world of design. And it looks like, here we go, we have Brittany. Hi, Brittany. Hi, guys. Hi, how are you? How are you? I'm doing pretty well. How's everything going with you? Everything's been going good. Everything's been going good, especially during this time right now. It's like one of those moments where you kind of have to realize like where you stand in life, right? It's like, what am I going to do exactly. with my life? How am I going to get up and be a better person? So, you know, it's definitely been hard, but intense. And I've been driven and as motivated as possible. So works keep work has to keep going. So. That's great to hear. I know. I think that you, when we were talking originally, when we were when we were booking you, you, you mentioned that fashion does not stop, regardless. Of yeah, it doesn't stop. It does yeah. not stop. <laughs> well, it, it's really great to have you on today, Brittany. And I know Lauren and I are both really excited to dig into your career. But first, uh, since New York Fashion Week took place last month. Um, and you had that really, really exciting opportunity yeah. um, that I got to see uh, with Rich Fresh. I watched it online. Uh, can you give our viewers some insight into what it was like opening for Rich Fresh as a part of the virtual Harlem's Fashion Row and explain to them what all those components are? Yeah, definitely. So, you know, because as we all know, during COVID and during this time, because of the pandemic, we've actually had to be able to start to do fashion shows virtually, which has been a huge impact in terms of the fashion industry in general. Like, I think that this is something that like they've wanted to do because they don't like to have a ton of people in audiences. There are a lot of people that can't get into the shows that should be in the shows and like understanding who sits in the front row, who sits in the back row. This gives viewers an opportunity to sit front row with the designer, with the models, with everyone front, front hand. And it was great. Um, I got the opportunity to work with Brandis Daniel, whom I absolutely adore and love. And she runs Harlem's Fashion Row, which is the first black um, community organization that 
helps bring up black designers. Um, the CFDA is in vogue, works with her as well in terms of highlighting these black designers and who they are. And so Harlem's Fashion Row got to open up New York Fashion Week this year, which was such an amazing opportunity. I got called by Rich Fresh, who Fresh is a great, great friend. Of, um, I actually interviewed him as a host. Um, I interviewed him for a Harlem's Red Design Retreat um, at the beginning of COVID, actually in March. And then I guess him and Brandis had a conversation and they were like, hey, we need a model to open up New York's Fashion Week with the CFDAs. And Brandis decided that I should be that model. Don't ask me why. <laughs> but I was like, me? Like open up New York's Fashion Week? Like sure, why not? I, I think it's an amazing opportunity. Plus my mother and my grandmother would <laughs> probably kill me if I shut it down. So, yeah. so it was great. Um, I think that like highlighting black designers has been such a huge focus, especially with like BLM happening currently. Um, and everything that's been going on, but it's something that has needed to happen. Um, and so for Harlem's Fashion Show to kind of get that front row access to do so, I, we can't thank Brandis enough. Um, so it was a great opportunity to be a part of. That's, that's amazing. Wonderful. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. What? And I'm not normally a model. Like I have modeled in the past, but like, you know, when you hit that like dirty 30 and you're like, ah, dirty 30. I don't, know, <laughs> I don't know if I can keep up with the kids nowadays. You know? <laughs> But it's been great. It's been great. What would like six-year-old Brittany would have thought yeah. about you opening New York Fashion Week? I think she wouldn't have said no. Um, I think that six-year-old Brittany, that was a dream of hers. That was a dream of hers. Uh, my grandmother's a fashion designer, which a lot of people don't know. And oh, she's wow. the reason why I started this career. Yeah. Um, I always tell people that I was like blood bred into this industry. So I think that she definitely would have made me be like, yeah, you're doing this, whether you like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but yeah, it was great. Um, it was definitely an opportunity of a lifetime. And I think that it kind of like fits the specs of like how you're supposed to live life, right? Like I probably wouldn't have done it if it would have been actually in New York on stage, like me walking. Yeah, right. That would have never happened. But like, because of the times that we're currently living in and like virtual reality, I think that this kind of gave me the opportunity to say yes to something that I couldn't have turned down. So it was great. All right, so speaking of taking these opportunities as they happen, obviously you come from reality TV. That's where a lot yeah. of people you from is the house of DVF and people myself included are fascinated by the process of reality television and what that actually is like to live it tell yeah. us about the experience on on house of DVF so I'll, I'll actually start with how it got started right because a lot of people always wonder like how did you get involved in reality TV um, at the time I was working for Nickelodeon and I was the head stylist for Nick. And so I was doing everyone from Ariana Grande to Jeanette McCurdy, um, to Tia yes. Mouse, everyone that you could think of, especially in this age demographic, they absolutely love Ariana. So she was a client of mine and I used to pull from Diane von Furstenberg's store on Melrose at the time. And this was in like 2014. And so I had got brought to the attention that Diane was doing a reality show. And I thought, and Diane loves this story, by the way, I thought that that was the craziest <laughs> thing in the world that she could have ever decided to do. Like, I was like, why is she a reality show? Like, this is, this is obvious. Like, it was just not right for the brand. I didn't think so. Um, and so my cousin turned me into the contest. So I got a phone call that, that they were doing the reality show, that they wanted me to come in and producers wanted to meet me. And so I did it. And it was so crazy. My mom told me two things when I moved to LA, like don't get on reality TV and don't like mess up your job. Like that's like all that she said. <laughs> and so when I told her, I was like, well, it has to do with Diane von Furstenberg and like designing. Um, I think that it was something that was really, really, really important for my own career and understanding who Diane the woman was. Working for her was an amazing opportunity. That's so incredible. What was, the, what was the experience actually like of being on a reality TV and show and living that? It was good. It was good and bad. I kind of heard you guys in the beginning say that like, you know, you kind of have to put on a show, right? Like, so sometimes it's like, are you an actor or are you currently working in the position? While we were on the set for, I believe it was, we did six weeks on, we filmed and then we went back home for a couple and then we came back on. Um, being on reality TV is a little bit different. It is a docu-series format where you are everything that you do 
So from you waking up in the morning to looking crazy with like, you know, your your shower cap on and like you're eating breakfast <laughs> and the cameras roll in to you being at work and it kind of shakes you up a little bit. There were moments that I definitely had where I wanted to throw in the towel and just be like, I can't do this anymore. Like emotionally, I don't know who I am and I don't know if this is who I want to be portrayed as. Um, producers constantly cut and paste what they want you to believe. Like I had an episode on the show where it was actually, I think it was like episode six and it's called the bitches out of the bag. That's literally what the title was. And it was all what? about me. Yeah. It was all about me wow. basically like kind of being myself though. And I think that like, I think in this industry, which in every industry, you kind of have to be catty, right? Being a woman and especially a black woman at that at the head of um, an industry that I was in, it was one of those things where I just was like, who can I be and who am I portraying myself as? Um, I think that with those type of opportunities, you kind of have to just be real with yourself. And to know that they did that and then they would be like in my face and then they'd be like, oh, but she's a really good girl and her work ethic is amazing. But like <laughs> in real life, she might kind of be bitchy, but you know. We won at the end, so that's all that matters. <laughs> yes, <laughs> snaps for that. Um, but I, but I just think that that is really interesting, and I think you kind of touched on it that, and, and you described it as caddy. But I think that anyone, when they're coming from a position where they're not looked at as supposed, they're 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 not supposed to be there and at the top of their industry. You, we just yeah. act the same way that other people act it's just that it's not the expectation of us you know i i, do, I really don't think Absolutely. i would say the same thing about a about a man or or, or yeah. someone else in that position. yeah and it's hard to kind of like you know you, you don't act the same way that you do with your friends and like your family versus how you act at work right i think how you yeah. carry yourself is a little bit different but i think in the space that i was in i i didn't really have a choice to have a camera in your face 24 7. i mean it was an amazing opportunity and i'd probably do it again <laughs> well, I it definitely takes um, s some courage to definitely do that because I was just thinking about when you were talking about eating breakfast and in the shower. You know, those are those are my times when I'm like, okay, I cannot I cannot perform for anyone right now. So to See? be on that mode all the time, like <laughs> I would go crazy. <laughs> and Ryan, that's the clip that they're gonna use. It's that little clip right there where you're like, I can't do this right now. It's that that they're gonna be like, we need oh. that. <laughs> Hard. I guess that's what they're they're good at, right? So yeah, um, yeah, very true. But Lauren and I, you know, we were talking earlier about, and I think you might have heard it about the intersection of art and fashion, and how yep. you know, even though fashion isn't the first thing that comes to mind when someone is talking about the arts, so much of the industry is centered, as as you know, on creativity and performance, everything from yeah. designing product to presenting it at a runway show, like what you did with Rich Fresh. And Absolutely. you get Billy Porter being carried into the Met Gala, like I said earlier, and you're like, well, of course, that is an entire performance. Yeah. It, it looks choreographed and everything. Um, so as someone who's yeah. in the fashion industry, do you characterize yourself as an artist? And if so, how does your art look and present differently from other kinds of fine and performing arts? Wow, this is, a, this is such a great question. You know, I... One of the things that I learned, right, like growing up, I was I was in the modeling industry first, um, and then it transitioned yeah. into me understanding what what college I wanted to go to. So when I went to FITM, I had to make a choice because back then they didn't have as many courses as they currently do now. So back then, I knew that I wanted to be a stylist. One of the things about being a stylist is being able to help someone else characterize who they are going to be or want to become. Um, on the platforms that, um, of which they're doing it, right? So me being a stylist, I was like, that's what I want to do. Back then, you couldn't take those courses. So I knew that instead of taking merchandising, which is like the book work of it all and like mathematics behind it all, I decided to go the design route, which also helped me kind of transform into like a costume designer per se. Um, okay. And that, it, so then that way you kind of have that form of like being able to like drape fabrics on a mannequin Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Um, so 
But in this industry, there are a ton of forms of like art forms. Um, even just being a stylist alone, there are different sets that you can actually become a stylist. So whether that's a, you're a wardrobe stylist and you just do like shopping for customers here and there and you have like celebrity clients um, or you do like red carpet affairs or you do editorial work or you do like just campaigns. But then there are also the ones that have to take like pilots out of a TV show and do the rundown of each characters or like you're on a movie set and you wanna you know, understand who they are and what they're supposed to be wearing. Um, so the different forms of arts definitely like carry themselves throughout this industry for sure. And then like you kind of said before, Lauren, with even just understanding like a fashion show for that matter, like working with different clothing and then building the story throughout, that's very important as a designer is that you have to tell a story, you have to know who your, your customer is, you know, the, you have to know the demographics of who it is that is shopping for you. And then you have to create that, like, I wanna say virtual world now, now of and how they're gonna shop. And so because of that, you kind of have to create that in your own mind and then visually present it to someone else and hope that they buy it. <laughs> <laughs> So a lot of that, all of what you said about being a stylist and the story you have to tell kind of takes us nicely into the other thing we wanted to talk about, which was your your job as an influencer. Um, and obviously that probably, yeah. that wasn't the yeah. title, title that existed back when you, in 2014 at FITM, I'm sure. It was not the title that existed. <laughs> um, so with, all, I mean, with all the marketing trends and moving on social media and you know Instagram and TikTok and Twitter and enlisting more popular figures like yourself mm -hmm. to market product, um, tell us about what that actually looks like, the process of being an influencer and how that evolved for you. Yeah, so becoming an influencer was really different back then. I um, I was signed by Next Models as um, an influencer back when I won the show, right? And this is when blogging was really, really important too. And I think that like the personal opinions of people, you know, of people of interest, um, I should say, was really important back then. Um, and because for us, it was more so connecting with different brands on a marketing ability and then being able to like portray so that consumers would buy, that's where influencers came from. Um, and a day in the life of me, I, I you know, it's a little, <laughs> like we talked about Lauren, it's a little bit different now because I am technically an influencer for certain brands, but then I also do a lot of digital marketing stuff for other brands. And so I do a lot of like build outs of who the current influencers are, whether they're on TikTok or, you know, or YouTube sensations or Instagram influencers. But I think that it's important nowadays to be an influencer with actual substance and have a voice. Um, having your own voice is very important because you can't just follow the lead of what everyone else is doing. And I think that that's kind of why I've had to even pull back myself because I think that my end all is to give back to girls that are younger, you know, and understanding of like what it is to be a black woman, a mixed one at that, and like to understand the industry of the fashion world, and then to understand what it's like to even work in this industry. Um, and so I think with moments like that, being an influencer is definitely just like knowing who you are. The day in my life is more so like getting gifts and like having to post them. <laughs> <and> like, <laughs> that doesn't sound and terrible. Do things like that. But you know, it's it's still fun. It's still great life. Yeah, and I I think that yeah. that yeah yeah we can hear you. You're good. And I, I that was definitely not something that I would expect, you know, when someone says, oh, that they're an influencer, like what they're doing when so much uh, your conversation about how important knowing yourself and having your voice is. Um, and I think that you do uh -huh. reflect that <clears throat> really well, especially on your social media and with everything that's going on um, in the U.S., especially today, you've been very okay. outspoken publicly about your identity and how you personally have to navigate your industry, as well as, of course, the murder of Breonna Taylor and the Black Lives yeah. Matter movement for racial justice and equity in the U.S. So will you share your perspective on how intersectionality and your identity have shaped your voice on social media and in the fashion industry as a whole? Yeah, absolutely. I think think that like understanding like you know you and I kind of talked about this before uh, understanding that black lives matter has been an important 
within not only our industry, but in the world, right? But in the industry alone, I think one of the biggest impacts that Breonna Taylor had on us as women, as black women at that in this industry, it was, it was shocking to us. Um, I did a post when we first found out about Breonna Taylor about how I purposely could not read the article, right? Like I couldn't read it. It happened on March 13th. My birthday was on the 16th. Selfishly, the world was ending. Like I was just not, you know, completely focused on like who she was and what she was about. And then to kind of hear about it after George Floyd and having to revisit a story, it kind of definitely gave me a feeling within that, that made me realize that like, this is the importance that a lot of us kind of walk away from. Um, and in terms of like how it's made a difference and an impact in our industry, there are a ton, a ton, a ton. I wish I can speak on the name of like all the women in this industry that are that are upheld and are the backbone of the fashion industry that are black. Um, you've got like Lindsay Peoples, who's, who's the head of Teen Vogue right now. You've got uh, two of my girl friends who are head of black um, the, the black fashion council that has just been started that are bringing brands and giving them awareness of like how many employees that they currently have that are black um, and those are again platforms that that need recognition of like black people being in the business and understanding that like we have a voice as well so in times like brianna taylor coming out and being like yo like this is this is the moment that we have to kind of shine a light on her because she was a black woman in her industry and needing to understand that like we didn't necessarily see her at face value from the beginning but i think that nowadays we all kind of have to sit back and recognize that like these are the moments that we have to you know, realize how important she actually was. Um, black women, I think overall are completely underrated. Like I think when I won House of DVF, it was such an influential moment of like Diane Von Furstenberg, the woman loved black women. She's the woman that has been a designer for years that would have a full runway as all black women. That's why Nye Campbell constantly like opens and closes her show. Like she is the designer that that is the epitome of understanding who black women are. Um, and I think that this was a time to really recognize that. But in terms of like understanding that the Black Fashion Council is alive and, and well, um, those are the moments that we care about the most. So, yeah. yeah. How but intentional are you in what you choose to share on social media? How do you make that, that judgment on what you want to put out on social media from a personal perspective? Ah, uh, oh, gosh. Uh, to be honest, it, it's tough. It's tough. I, I get kind of emotional and like riled up, like thinking about it because it's not easy. Um, it's not easy to be a black woman and like open up my phone and read something that has currently happened and not feel the need to like have that rage inside and want to post it. Um, but sometimes I have to take a step back and realize like, is this going to affect my business? Are people going to feel some type of way? But I think that like, again, social media for us is our news outlet and that's who we are as people. And we have to be able to like say that voice out loud, even if that means that I'm going to cry or even if that means that I, you know, have to pour my heart out, whether whether you're wrong or right in that matter doesn't necessarily matter, you know? Um, but I think that it's moments like that, that that are really important. So I have to be a voice. I have to. I think that I, I have enough followers that care about those not be silent. So that's, that's great to hear. And I'm glad that you are continuing to be a voice, <clears throat> that you have been a voice since you know, your time on House of DVF and that you, there was something that when I was watching, I, I was watching a clip from House of DVF when we first uh, booked you and I was looking you up and everything. And you just spoke about how you had to be true to yourself. And I think yeah. that that, is, that definitely from, from just all my conversations with you, that's definitely been your through line. And I think that's one of the reasons why so many people do look up to you. And um, I hope that you continue to, um, you know, be a leading voice. And I know that you'll continue to be a leading voice in your, in the fashion industry. And uh, there are many, many bright things ahead for you that we're looking forward to seeing as well. So we're really thankful um, for getting to talk to you today. No, thank you guys for having me. I'm so, so excited. I, I get to do this often, whether it's with FedEx or you guys. So I appreciate you guys having me on today. Thank yes, you so um, much. Thank you. And if you guys, uh, if you enjoyed, uh, for our viewers, if you enjoyed listening to Brittany today, definitely go give her a follow on Instagram at B Hampton um, to keep up with everything that she's doing. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Thanks Brittany. Brittany. Have a great rest of your day.
Bye. Well, I love her. Yes. Um, <laughs> it's she's just so great to talk to, right? I, I was telling you that that entire time. Yeah, yeah, just so authentic. Um, and I think that's where that's where we are, and that's why she has the followers that she does, right? I mean, even coming from reality TV, which sometimes is more authentic than others, yeah. right? Depending on what it is. Um, people sniff it out quickly if you're not really who you say you are. Yeah. Um, and to me, she feels like someone who really is who she says she is. Definitely. And and like you said, I think that is the most, if we talk about an, a true artist, the, that yeah. is the quality of being a true artist, you know, knowing yourself and, and being true to yourself and, and sharing that with the world because there are so many people who need to hear that story. And I, I, I think that it's just so wonderful that she continues to tell her story and be so true to herself. So that's awesome. Um, yeah. And such great messages, especially because I know she, yeah. um, she is such a good role model and, and wants that. And so such good messages to share with young women and especially young black women. Yeah, of course. Um, but you know, now, uh, we're going to close out really quickly with one of my favorite segments of lunch and learn what we're watching this week. So you can tune in on some of the best content that the industry has to offer this week. I've been on YouTube rewatching all the skits from Saturday night live. They are back with their new season, season 46, and they're back live from New York, not in their houses anymore in the studio. And it just makes me so happy to see some semblance of a return to normalcy in the world of entertainment and and comedy. They have some great skits spoofing the debate, which definitely needed spoofing and <laughs> helping us laugh about the world of COVID. So if you do need a good laugh, I definitely recommend checking out their new episode. So my recommendation this month actually is a live stream with people still in their homes. Okay. <laughs> um, one, of, one of the bright spots of all this for me has been getting to see events that normally you wouldn't be able to see unless you could travel to New York and had many hundreds of dollars for tickets and all that kind of stuff. Every year there's an annual concert called Miss Cast, oh, yes. which is a big fundraiser and Broadway celebration where Broadway stars come and perform songs that they normally would never get from roles they would never get to play. Either men singing songs written for women or vice versa or much older or much younger, whatever it is. Um, and no, and the, the biggest Broadway stars come and do it. And this year it was all virtual and they all performed from their homes. And some of them did really, really creative things. Rob McClure from Mrs. Doubtfire did uh, Worst Pies in London from Sweeney Todd from the perspective of the pie. Oh, wow. he from the perspective of the pie, he <laughs> and shot it all. And like you go into his oven at the end. It's great. What? It's amazing. It's amazing. And the whole thing is a fundraiser for um, MCC Theater and also the Kenneth Cole Mental Health Coalition. So it supports really okay. great causes. Just Google Miscast 2020 and you can see all the performances from this year. Leslie Odom performed with his wife, all kinds of great stuff. Oh, him and Nicole are the best. <laughs> right? They were, they were brilliant together. Also, speaking of excellent causes, if you enjoyed spending time with us today, we encourage you to support the Lead Centered Relief Fund to ensure that the arts and programming like this can remain an essential part of the Lincoln community. You can find the donation link on our website. And that just about wraps up this month's edition of Lunch and Learn. Make sure to mark your calendars because on Tuesday, November 3rd, yes, we will be here with you on election day. So go vote <laughs> early so you can be with us live or after. 8-8 eight, eight, polls are open or vote by mail now. Whatever you need to do, just vote. Yes. Um, but on Tuesday, November 3rd, we'll be with Joe Salvatore, who is a professor from New York University to discuss what happens when theater meets political activism appropriate for election day. Be on the lookout yep. for more information on that on our website. Yes, and I'm really excited to bring him on. I think he's gonna be great. I think you guys are gonna Very love him. And just touching on voting a bit, I am turning in my ballot today. So that way I can uh, be live on election day with you guys. So you guys should all do that too. I'll be counting on you guys to be here. 
but a special thanks to Stephen Colonna and Cole Taubert in the virtual control room, Liv LeBlanc and Matthew Boring in marketing, and Sapphire Toth, Sasha Dobson, and Jane Shermai Hansen in the education department. This series would not be possible without their support and hard work. And before we sign off today, we have a clip of the iconic Billy Porter making his 2019 Met Gala entrance. So now you can all see the scene I've been referencing. Uh, his outfit was in full camp glory, which is which was the theme of last year's Met Gala. And it was amazing. I went and saw it in New York City. Mm -hmm. For our viewers who aren't familiar with the style of camp, it's defined as an aesthetic style and sensibility that regards something as appealing because of its bad taste and ironic value. And it's often been associated with the LGBTQ community and queer identity as a whole. So just another way we see fashion present itself as a high art form. So stay tuned to the stream for that glorious fit and we will see you guys soon. Wow, wow. good luck getting up the stairs with that. I'm excited to see his core strength and balance. Whoa, he is spreading his wings. Look at you. Yeah, hello, I got wingspan over yes, here. Yes, Speaking yes. of wings, we got Billy Porter with a side of wings tonight. Let me yes, see that. Honey. Oh, yes. hey, let me hey. get the wingspan. Wow, there we go. Ka Kapam. Shahu. <laughs> you, you literally just drained my bank account. That's what you just did. <laughs> Your Oscars outfit was absolutely incredible and Thank sparked you. such a wonderful conversation. You think you topped it tonight? I'm not trying to top any day. Ah. I'm just trying to show up and be appropriate for the moment. Well, you look absolutely more than appropriate. You look Thank wonderful. You. How would you describe camp and how is it so intertwined in society today? Well, the kids call it extra. Yeah. <laughs> for many, many years, it's been uh, used as a pejorative. And I think when you have something like this, you know, it brings the respect back right. to something that is high, high art, high craft. You know, I've, I've, I've built a career on playing campy characters. You know, I have a career. I have this life because of that. Tell me about your look and your performance tonight. How, how long did it take to plan that and coordinate that? Well, the, the look came because Ryan Murphy said to me, you should go as uh, Diana Ross, all five looks from the mahogany montage. I was like, bitch, I don't want to work that hard. Um, but I got the idea for the Egyptian look. That was yes. the one that stuck out to me. And then we went to the blondes and go. Cleopatra, Cleopatra. There yes. Go. You know, I wanted something that was positive. I wanted something that was about, you know, forward motion, upward motion. You know, that's what we want for society, right? Yes, yes. Come on, let's grow, yeah, let's yeah, prosper. Yeah, yeah. Well, yes. you look absolutely wonderful. Thank I hope you, you enjoy your amazing Met. Thank, thank you for thank blessing you. the carpet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you so sir. much. Some Billy Porter served up with wings on the